Hello, everybody. I'm Captain Jim Palmer, the Dream Business Coach. I'm the founder of the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program, creator of Dream Business Academy, founder of No Hassle Newsletters, my first uh, online business long time ago, and host of Dream Business Radio, this podcast now in its ninth year. And I um, want to welcome you to another fantastic live edition of Dream Business Radio. My special guest is Jessica Fialkovich. I hope I said that right. I think I did because Perfect. I interviewed it before. This episode of Dream Business Radio is brought to you by the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program. If you're an entrepreneur or small business owner, you're feeling overwhelmed, unfocused, or if you'd like to learn how to create multiple streams of revenue, something I'm very good at, then check out my mastermind. It's at dreambizcoaching, dreambizcoaching.com. All right, let me introduce my special guest. Don't you don't like the way I do like 11 second commercials? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Jessica became an entrepreneur at the age of 25 and since has been able to successfully establish, develop, and sell multiple small businesses in a number of industries. In the last eight years, Jessica has been able to build her business brokerage firm from a two-person team to one of the top firms in the country. Under her leadership, the firm has been the number one trans world business advisors franchise location in the world for the last five years and has made the Inc. 5000 list for the last three years. She's been recognized by Financial Times, the Denver Business Journal and others. She's the founder of Exit Factor, which is cool. I think you're getting to understand what we're going to be talking about, mm -hmm. which teaches business owners how to buy and sell businesses for the most profit and the least amount of time. This same passion and knowledge is now embodied in Jessica's brand new book, which she sent me a copy, but the Coast Guard has not brought it to me yet. No, I'm just kidding. Which is getting the most for selling your business. It went live on April 1st, which is an amazing, anybody that can get a book done, everyone, oh, I got a book in me. But when you get your book published, it's a big deal. And um, the reason I had, I had Jessica, I think we both were just talking about, um, she was on my program about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked her back because uh, with her new book, uh, I think there's some more expertise to be had. Now, my audience, Jessica, well, first of all, welcome to Dream Business Radio. Thank How are you? you? Yeah, it's great to be back. It's great to see you again, Captain Jim. Yeah, my my audience, small business owners, is exactly who your information is for. So I seldom have people back unless they're really good or it's a topic that I love and really I think will benefit my audience. Now, how to sell a business is very, very big. I know people that have done it well. I know people that have like decided I'm going to sell my business 30 days later. They take quite a bath. So yeah. anyway, um, I'm excited to learn more from your book, but tell me a little bit more about your backstory. How did you get into being an entrepreneur at 25? It sounds like, did you graduate college and figure out you didn't want to work in a cubicle or what was that journey like? Yeah. So um, I, I graduated college and I, I moved actually into professional sports. So I started mm -hmm. working for, I was um, I'm originally from the Philadelphia area. So I worked for the Philadelphia Eagles and then the Flyers for a few years. And then I was caught in the Great Recession, um, like many of my other millennial counterparts. So during um, 2008, actually, I had moved into commercial real estate development and had um, hit that kind of wall. Um, real estate got hit really hard during 2008 and nine, And um, all these dreams that I had of working for, like my my parents, it was funny, my grandparents were entrepreneurs. And then when my parents saw the roller coaster ride that their parents went through, they were big believers in like working for big corporate companies because that was safe, right? Right. Well, and in 2008, I discovered that's not exactly safe, right? We just had this, uh, my husband and I also worked for the same company, which wasn't um, the, the best oh, strategy no. in the world. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you have this, this, you know, person sitting up in some big building in Times Square, just taking line items off a p &L, right? When the recession hit and we were a line item, right? So um, our whole department got laid off and that really crushed my dream of like, hey, a safe and secure career is with a big corporate giant. And that was when I had the realization is that a safe and secure career is really one where I can depend on myself. Right. Um, so that's when I made the jump into entrepreneurship um, done with winters. So moved to Florida and we started a wine store. Um, we thought drinking wine and hanging out in the sun would be super fun. Why not? <laughs> Sounds good to I, me. I, I mean, it, it was actually, well, it was really fun. Um, so we did, we did that for a few years and actually, um, you know, opening a business during a recession is pretty beneficial in some cases. Um, a lot of costs are lower and things like that. So we enjoyed 
pretty quick growth um, and did very well through the recession. And then as the economy was starting to get back and it, our industry was starting to get back in 2012, we had an opportunity to exit that business. Um, so we decided to sell it at that time. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was introduced to the whole buying and selling businesses. Like I didn't even know that was a thing for small businesses until we went through that process. Wow. So just out of curiosity, then we'll dive in. Were, did you have parents or grandparents entrepreneurs or were you like first generation entrepreneur? No, it skips my parents' generation. My grandparents on my father's side, um, actually uh, all the way back, you can trace our family history back all the way to like bootleggers. Um, no way. I think one of the, yeah, it was, was one of the original family businesses. So we had, um, you know, I think three generations removed from me were bootleggers. We had a couple generations that owned bars. And then my grandfather owned a chain of pharmacies in um, the central New Jersey and Pennsylvania area. Well, I'm going to guess the bootleggers isn't a business that you could really sell. So <laughs> you yeah, just I know, right? <laughs> make your money and get out. So yeah. um, I want to dive into the book. Um, what I know about um, selling a business only because I've, I, when I was in franchising, we bought several businesses. So you kind of learn both sides, whichever right. way you go. And then I know a couple of people who have sold businesses. Um, one of the things I believe it has to do with timing and valuation. Um so let's see, where do we start? How about valuation? I think people assume because they've been in business either a long time, or I think if you're selling a business, you probably have a lot of, um, you know, sweat equity and you're emotionally tied to it, but there really is a formula, right? There's some kind of mm -hmm. a science that how do you, so what an incredibly long question. How do you properly, <laughs> how do you properly value a business for sale? Yeah, it's a great question. And I mean, it's the, the number one question we get asked with clients. Mm -hmm. And and we do talk about it in the book. Actually, a, a metaphor I use in the book is treating your business like a baby, right? Okay. So, and, and there is some emotion tied to it. But when we're looking at valuation, there is a formula. Um, it's mostly it's mostly science, but part a little bit part art. Okay. And, and it, if we boil the formula down, when you sell a business, you're paid a multiple of your earnings. Now that earnings number can differ. Um, sometimes it's revenue. Sometimes like in the franchise industry, it's monthly recurring royalties, right? But for most businesses, that earnings number is um, what's called EBITDA or earnings before income tax, depreciation and amortization. And how that multiple is determined is there is usually a range um, based on your industry, the size of your company, but there's also, this is where the art part comes in. There's a qualitative factor, right? So some businesses might be worth three times okay. their EBITDA where similar industries are worth five times. And, and that's where like that gets into like how involved are you in the company? How secure and stable is the company? How long has it been around? What do your margins look like? And there's a lot of different things that go into that qualitative um, factor, but it, it is part quantitative too, right? The more money your company okay. earns, the more it's worth. Which I think presents a little bit of a problem for most small business owners, especially if you sell quickly. You know, you're, obviously, we're going to pay less taxes on the smaller your profit is, right? So as a small business right. owner, you might have several all legitimate legal and moral deductions, but that make it beneficial to be a business owner. And But then you look when you present your what you made as a profit, it looks really small, even though if you're smart, you're going to point out, oh, look, here's what, you know what I mean? How do you, yeah. what do you do with that? Do you, do you say, well, stop doing that for three to five years and really build up a healthy bottom line or, or do, are most people who buy businesses savvy enough to know that? Um, no, most people aren't uh, as savvy enough to know that actually a big chunk of people that are buying businesses are first time entrepreneurs. So we do want to okay. make some adjustments to that. So, I mean, the easiest way is you can do something called adjusted EBITDA where you make those adjustments and you add back. I mean, some common add backs there are, um, you know, like we talked about interest, taxes, depreciation, depreciation is a non-cash expense. So you can add that back. Um, sometimes you can make adjustments for big capital investments, things like, things like that. Uh, another thing I do recommend though, and I talk about out in the book is that if you know you're going to be selling your business in the future, you have two options. So about three years is really the, the rule of thumb, three years leading up to the sale. You can stop taking those legitimate deductions and make your bottom line healthier. Mm -hmm. And you can either take it as a hit, like you're going to pay more personally in taxes for that short period of time. Or if you have a different business or a different entity, say that you're not going to be selling, you could move those expenses there. 
Um, so I, I find a lot of, yeah, I find a lot of entrepreneurs have like holding companies or consulting companies where they run through some random revenue and expenses that aren't related to their operating business. Um, so you could use that strategy or start a new entity, a new company to absorb those expenses that aren't directly related to your operating business. So you still get the tax deduction. I think the big three, and feel free to correct me, the big three are are, are the um, cash flow, your customer list, and what I call, can the business run without me? So if somebody buys a business on Friday, you disappear into the, you know, the Costa Rica, can the new owner run the business on Monday morning? Are, are those the main three or, or is there something else that we need to look at? Yeah. I mean, very similar. So what I talk about is first is um, the financials, right? So cash flow, like you said, but also me really having and maintaining clean books and records. So we talked about those adjustments and legitimate expenses you can run through the business, but you don't want to creep into the gray zone and have too many of those expenses in there. Okay. And then you also want to have your books and records up to date. So financials is the is a number one, probably is what makes a business sellable versus not. Um, number two, like stepping away. Uh, we call it owner operated um, versus owner absentee businesses. So okay. an owner operated business is where you're involved in the day to day. An owner absentee business is when you can disappear to Costa Rica for as long as you want and the business keeps running, right? Mm. <laughs> but if the closer you can get to the Costa Rica uh, design, the more valuable the business is going to be worth and the easier it is to sell. Um, and the last thing I talk about too is it's really related to the, the marketing strategy um, when you're going to sell your business is, is having options and creating competition, right? So if you're limiting yourself um, to designing the business to sell to one buyer or one exit strategy, then you're limiting your opportunity, right? That buyer could walk away. So having multiple options, whether that's selling to a third party buyer, maybe somebody internally like an employee or something like that. And then if you are going to take it to market, like advertising it to multiple buyer groups. So you're creating that competition and you're giving okay. yourself a higher likelihood it'll sell. Okay. Um, so I want to ask you a couple of questions. Your book is called Getting the Most for Selling Your Business. Um, I think we sort of talked about the people market financials. Um, what's the preparation timeline? You mentioned three years. Is there more to it than that or probably <laughs> or do you just make it and how do you know i mean sometimes there's sickness or family you got to sell your business quickly but let's say with all things being equal and and you're on a go track if you want to sell your business three years down the road wh what does that timeline look like yeah and three years is really ideal like i hear okay. you know some of my colleagues will talk about five to ten year strategy let's be honest like nobody can predict what's going to happen in this world in five to 10 years. So setting a strategy that long term is really difficult in this, in this market and environment. Um, three years is ideal. You can affect change um, in 12 months too. So like three years, you can, you can really sit down and define an exit strategy. You can um, define ways you can grow and you can use some pretty complex um, growth methodologies. So you could grow through acquisition. Um, you could open new branches of your business, things like that within three years while also getting getting, you know, the market, the people, the financials all in order. Um, it, within 12 months, you can affect change, but you're just diving more deep into those two pieces the financials and, and the owner operator, like that people component. I, I think below 12 months, it's really hard to make a huge change in the valuation or the trajectory of the company. I've seen clients do it. Um, I've seen clients, you know, affect some change in valuation in six months. Um, but it, it is difficult to do and it takes a lot of effort on the owner's part inter and in addition to continue to run to run, run the business. Right. Right. So, Jessica, if three years is optimum and you explained how it gets a little uh, perhaps not optimal for two in year one, it, does it grow with year four or five or is three years really the sweet spot? And does it change with the type of business? Yeah, it, I mean, it, it really comes down to what the strategy is to grow that valuation. So why I said like it's hard to do it longer than three years is because then then we have and we even talked about this yet, but like timing in the market. Play. Right now we're in a seller's market for business owners. So, you know, if you're thinking about selling, now's a great time, right? And if we're trying to predict what the market's going to do, it's almost like predicting what the stock market's going to do in mm -hmm. five years. It's really hard. So you could get caught in this thing where you're, you're growing your business and you're growing your valuation, but something might change in the overall 
market or in your industry specifically, that's going to lower multiples, right? So you could get caught and you grow, 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 but then the multiples are lowered and who knows what happens. So yes, it, it could continue to grow in year five, year six, year seven, but it's harder to predict, right? And, and create a really well-defined strategy. That's why I say really three years, um, because we can, we can at least look into the future, you know, one to three years and say, Hey, we, we think this is going to remain stable or we think it's going, multiples are going to hold around here. Um, but yeah, but you, it could, it could happen. It's just, I mean, if we all had a magic ball and knew what's going to happen in the market five years yeah. from now, I think we'd all be on a boat like you, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if you, you don't want to know what I was doing an hour ago. So, <laughs> so in your book, um, you have, I think three or four chapters all called top 10. So I won't ask you to name all 10 for each one, but let's, let's go to the mistakes one. What are maybe the mm. top three mistakes that people make when they're selling a business? And then let's flip it over and say, what are the top, what are the top three mistakes people make when buying a business? Yeah. So definitely number one for selling is, is related to expectations. So I often say that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of information out there about how to start a business, how to grow a business. There's not a lot about how to sell a business. And most of the time, and, and Jim, you alluded to this, people come to the marketplace and they have to sell, right? And mm -hmm. it's a shortened time frame, And because of that, they're not really educated on the process. So their expectations of valuation of what they should receive for their company are wildly, um, usually over up optimistic. Sometimes they're under. Um, but that that's a big mistake because in this world, there's no buyers that are going to lowball you. Right. right. So, um, you, you create like a short term marriage to the buyer and the seller, cause there is a transition period. So the buyer wants to maintain that relationship. So if you overprice your business, you just don't get any bites. Um, so that's, that's definitely the number one mistake. Um, the second big mistake I see is, is business owners going at it alone. Um, and that means professional advisors, but also having a support system around you. Um, selling a business is a full-time job on top of your other full-time job of running the business. So having really good advisors around you that can take mm -hmm. that load off is important. Um, but it's also an emotional decision and process for a lot of small business owners. And it, it's a very lonely one. Um, it's a confidential process. You can't talk to your employees about it. You can't talk to your clients about it. So having someone, um, and even sometimes not your spouse, right? Cause they're emotionally yeah. invested too. Having someone to help you through that process. That's another big mistake that I see, um, small business owners make. And the last one is related to timing, right? So sometimes you can't control the time, um, but for most of us, we can. And um, I, I talk about in the in the opening introduction story, when I decided to sell my wine company, um, we were 27 when we sold that company. And I had never thought about an exit strategy or planning for the future, but like I was 27, like I wasn't <laughs> planning on selling wine for the rest of my life. Right. So right. I, I knew I would exit at some point, but like, I just, I'd never addressed that. Um, so if that's a big mistake. I see a lot of owners make, like we will all exit our businesses somehow in some way, and, and it will happen in the future, but not having that conversation internally with yourself until you're forced to is a, is a big mistake. Okay. Um, Sorry about the little hiccup there. And I'm, no I'm, people people know I'm on boat Wi-Fi, so yeah. I'm not plugged in anywhere. It's all like little boxes run on batteries anyway. Yeah. Um, so uh, bef before we move into the mistakes on the buying side, the expectations from your experience, is that largely tied to just being emotionally attached to the business? Uh, in other words, do people just put too high a value on it because they know what it means to them? Like you said, it's their baby. Is that the number one reason I'm guessing? Yeah, that, that's usually the number one reason. Sometimes it's tied to of what they have to get out of the business, right? Okay. Um, and, and that's really about managing balance sheets and debts and liens and things like that appropriately. But it is, it's usually emotional. Um, it, it's like, I just feel like I've put so much time and effort and sweat equity into this. It's, it's worth more. Um, and, and realistically, sometimes it's worth more to keep a business, right? So we talk about a multiple of earnings. And if you think of that, it's basically like you're just getting paid for the next three to five years up front, right? Or two to five right. years up front. And, and so if you are planning on keeping the business for 10 years and you like what you're doing, sometimes it's more financially viable to keep it. And that's the, the struggle I see a lot of owners have. Yeah. Um, you know, this might, I, I assume this will be semi related, but when Stephanie and I sold our house like five years ago, of course the business I'm in as a coach, I'm, I'm all about getting expert advice. Right. right. So my Stephanie said one, one night, 
I bet, and this is one of those challenges, spousal challenges. I bet you know enough about marketing. You could sell our house without us hiring a realtor, right? <laughs> oh man, challenge. But um, what we did is we brought in a, uh, a real estate consultant and then we hired a professional house uh, organizer, I don't know, displayer, whatever they do. They walk mm -hmm. around and tell you, take this down, get rid of that, take all those family pictures out, remove this rug, show your hardwood floor. And then yep. we had professional pictures done. So we did all that and like our house sold fairly quickly. So we did utilize experts, yep. um, which is, I think that's the, that's your big message here when you're working, um, when you're working with a, okay, let's go to, um, yep. We're, time is whipping away. T Ten minutes. <laughs> Let's go to the mistakes when you're um, buying a business. What are what are some of those? Yeah. Um. So, the number one mistake I see buyers make is um they're they're kind of a jerk in the process, and mm. and it, it doesn't they're not intentionally doing that. But when you're buying a business, your job is to inspect and basically can kind of rip apart the business, like make sure you're getting what you're paying for, understanding the growth opportunities in the future. But we just talked about like to the seller, this is their baby, right? Right. So when when you start asking questions as a buyer, you have to be really careful how you phrase it. It doesn't come across accusatory or judgmental um, because ultimately what I say is a lot of sellers – it goes back to the whole people do business with people they know, like, and trust, right? right. So a lot of the, the clients we've worked with, if they decide they don't like somebody, they will not sell them their business. It doesn't matter how great the deal is. They're just not selling them their business. That's the number one um, mistake I see. Um, the number two mistake I see is a lot of buyers come in, same thing on the uninformed side, and they think they have to pay full cash for a business. Um, and that's actually completely untrue. So there's a lot of great financing vehicles, whether it's seller financing, SBA programs, um, there's some non uh, nonprofit lending programs, and they almost sell themselves short of what they can afford and how they can leverage their capital of not having to pay all cash for a business. Hmm. Very um, interesting. Yep. And then the last thing I see, and this is after usually the deal is done, but buyers that make changes too soon. So I have um, a rule of thumb when I'm talking to a buyer, even for myself when I buy a business, is don't change anything for six months. Okay. Especially if you're getting into a business you don't know, just sit back, observe for six months. You may have some you know, judgments or understandings of changes that need to be made, but just sit back and observe, get to know the people, let them get to know you, and then start to implement some of the changes instead of coming in day one and ripping the Band-Aid off, right? Yeah, because I think for employees, staff, vendors, and customers, they're they're kind of wanting to see what happens. And if you start making a bunch of changes too fast, people would probably start jumping ship. So I right. think that's I think that's really solid advice. One of the chapters was about mistakes about financing, and and I think you just touched on one. Do people think okay, I have fifty or a hundred thousand dollars, I can therefore afford a fifty or hundred thousand dollar business, or how, what do they know about what kind of options are there for financing? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of great options and we're sitting in an environment where money is quite available still. Mm -hmm. um, interest rates have spiked a little bit, um, like we've seen across like housing markets and stuff, but still very available. So there's um, programs um, through the Small Business Administration. They're still offered through the banks. Like the bank will still loan you the money and make you make the ultimate decision. Um, but what the uh, SBA does is they guarantee those loans to the bank to create an incentive for the banks to loan money to small businesses. Um, so usually in those loan products, um, you can buy a business for about 20% down is about average. So you could leverage that hundred thousand dollars to buy a million dollar business, right? Okay. Um, if, with some seller financing um, in there too. So, so that's, that's usually what we can see is you can leverage that. Um, seller financing is very common in small business transactions. Like the seller is not going to finance the whole part of the business, um, but usually somewhere between 10 and 50% will see a seller finance part of that. And it's usually not just because of the money, but also like knowing that that seller is going to pick up the, your phone call as a buyer six months from now, if you have a question, right? They have sure. some type of incentive to answer that phone call. Which is another reason not to be a jerk to the yeah, seller, exactly, right? right? Yeah. Um, so how common is it? I mean, like if you sell a boat, you hope to never hear from the guy again, guy or gal. But when you buy a business, there, I'm sure there's got to be some period where you're you're free to ask questions, whether email, get together, or whatever. Or is that is that even something that's negotiated as part of the buy sell agreement? 
Yeah, it is negotiated. Um, so there's usually a free period of training and transition where the seller makes that themselves available for a defined period of time. We see that um, usually the average is two to four weeks. Sometimes it's a couple months for larger businesses or more complex businesses. And then um, oftentimes too, a seller and a buyer can agree on top of that where the seller might stay on as a consultant. Um, and that's a paid period. So like the, mm. the first the transition training is usually included in the purchase price, but like maybe, you know, um, Jim, I buy your business and I say, Hey, I just want, I, I want to be able to call you and ask questions for up to 10 hours a week for the next 12 months. And I'll pay you a hundred dollars an hour. So usually there, there could be some type of agreement for that. It's, it, it is a short term marriage. Um, we usually mm -hmm. see the buyer and seller interacting over the course of about a year or less, um, after the transactions completed. Yeah. The, ex the limited experience I had when we were buying uh, bike stops and things like that is there's like the honeymoon stage. Okay. The business is done. You're getting a few questions. And then when the former owner sees the changes being made and I'm not doing it this way. And they say, well, that, I wouldn't do that. It didn't work that way. Well, it's my business now. <laughs> it seems like the marriage quickly dissolves. I don't know if that's common or not, but I've, I've seen that on more than one occasion. It happens a lot. Another, actually, I don't think I've listed it in the top 10 mistakes, but another mistake I see a lot of sellers will say, Hey, I'm willing to stay on and work for the new owner. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, so this is your baby, right? This business that you've built. Um, most likely, most of these sellers, they haven't been an employee for quite some time, right? And now they're volunteering to be an employee for somebody else who's now controlling the future of their baby. That's um, it. They own it, right? <laughs> yeah, they own it. So it's it, it doesn't... I've only seen it work out. Um, I've been in this business for 10 years and we've done about 500 deals. I've seen it work out once. Um, oh, to give you an idea. <laughs> that's so. that's rough. That's brutal. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Jessica, um, you start out in your book called the the beginning or the end is really the beginning, right? Um, which is I'm ending the interview, going back to the beginning. But so the end is really the beginning. I'm, I'm you have three or four minutes to talk about it, but I'm assuming you mean think about when you're going to sell your business, even if you're brand new, or am I reading into that? Yeah, no, it, it's it's definitely like, you know, you should begin with the end in mind, right? And, and what I, I talk about a lot is, and we, we mentioned this beginning of the interview, is most people decide to sell because there's a personal trigger in their life. Um, they want to chase a new opportunity, or sometimes more fortunately, they're sick or something's going on that forces them for sale. Mm -hmm. So what, what I say is you don't have to have this defined exit strategy in the beginning, day one for your business, but you at least have to think about what are those options going to be if you hit that day. So designing a business that can be sellable at any time for the maximum values, super important. It's also important to have like a backup strategy. Like maybe, maybe you have an unwind strategy or a close of business strategy, or maybe your backup strategy is you're going to sell it to your business partner or an internal employee, but really having those options and plans in place the day you open your business is ideal. Uh, most of us don't do that. So most of us do, don't do that. That's yeah, right. If you, if you didn't do that and you're listening to this interview, like today's that day to figure out what, what are those options in the future for me? Hmm. So one last question I'll dive in based on that. When is the right time to uh, talk to with a, a professional like yourself? I mean, when is too soon and, and what would that relationship look like? Look, I, I don't think it's too soon to ever have a conversation, right? The worst thing you're going to, you're going to, you know, you'll waste maybe an hour of your time if you find it's a waste of time, but you're, you're going to walk away of a, a strong understanding of like, is, is my company worth something? Um, is it not? Is it sellable? Is it not? Um, and, and you'll gain some insights into what the market's doing specific to your industry, things like that. So I, I don't ever think there's a bad time to have a conversation, even if, you know, we, I've worked with people that, there's exit strategies 10 years away. And what's happened sometimes is we had a client last year, her exit strategy was 10 years away. We had a conversation, we did a couple consulting sessions together and then something like that hit. She had a family mm. emergency, she had to move across the country and sell the business. And she was in significantly better shape just from those few conversations than she would have been if that had hit her and it had not happened. Um, wow. I'll, also say something about timing too, just to think about it. Like we talk a lot about market timing and seller's markets and things like that. The best time to sell your business, if you're in this for financial gain, right? You're saying like, hey, I don't care about my business. It's not my baby. I'm just here to make some money. The best time to sell your business is when you're on the way up, right? You never want to sell at a plateau because right. after a plateau, usually comes a you downfall. You go down, that's it. Yeah. So you will always want to sell your business 
on the way up. As it's growing, as you're building, as you're making more money, you're always going to get a better valuation on the way up. Very good. Well, I, I really enjoy our conversations. You're super smart at what you do. So two things, how can people connect with you, learn from you, and then where do you want them to get the book? Yeah. So the best way to connect with me is um, you can go to our website, exitfactor.com. Um, all of our social media is connected through there. Um, you can also search my name on Google. There's only one of me in the world. So Jessica Fiakovich. And um, on exitfactor.com, you can also order the book, Getting the Most for Selling Your Business. It's available um, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, all those big retailers. Wow. So exitfactor.com, that's the website. Yep. Very cool. Jessica, thank you so much. It was, it was uh, great reconnecting with you and, and congratulations on your book. You as well. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Hey, folks, that wraps up this very special interview with Jessica Fialkovich. And you can see why there's no confusion on which <laughs> Jessica is. So anyway, I highly recommend you connect with her again. I, I interviewed her a little over a year ago and, and she's super smart at what she does. Um, you can connect with me at getjimpalmer.com. If you're interested in joining me in about 28 other smart entrepreneurs in an awesome mastermind, the Dream Business Mastermind, go to dreambizcoaching.com. Remember, you can get free digital copies of my six books at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and the iBook Store. But that's it until this time next week. Another fantastic interview. I'm Captain Jim Palmer, the Dream Business Coach, and you take good care.